Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is bassist Harvey Brooks. His credits include everything from Bob Dylan, Al Cooper, The Electric Flag, The Doors, to Miles Davis, Richie Havens, Seals and Croft, John Sebastian, Cass Elliott, The Fabulous Rhinestones. It's, it's an endless list if you've grown up in particularly, I guess, the 70s era. You've probably heard his music if you haven't heard of him. He is the author of a memoir called View from the Bottom. And uh, welcome to the show, Harvey. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Joining us from Jerusalem, where it is, uh, I guess, late evening by now, right? We're at uh, 7, 5 or 7, 7, 10 or something. Oh, okay. So not too bad. Not past your bedtime or anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now it's nice and light. We have, uh, we have our spring, summer, and it's really you know, nice weather. I'm happy to say. Good to hear. Like Colorado was a blizzard or something. 20, 20 inches of snow in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. No. <laughs> Um, so your book opens with something that I really love because it's so true and it's so poignant for so many of us. You say basically uh, something along the lines of, um, I was in the right place at the right time. And that for me has been sort of a summation of not only my career, but so many of our careers, especially in the arts and in the music industry. It's right. really kind of a matter of just what do they say? Success is 90% just showing up, you know, being there at the right time and having the right, being open to the right opportunities and just letting serendipity take its course. Right. Now also when, as you go through life, you, you realize there are opportunities. So being at the right place at the right time means that an opportunity happened and you were able to uh, work on it. You were able to make it happen. Now, I've had times in my life, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, where opportunities have happened and I was in no shape to recognize what I should have done that I didn't do. You know, maybe I was smoking too much weed or I was being an idiot. Or maybe it was something that just went by and I didn't, didn't get it. But the whole idea is when those op opportunities come, when you are at the right place at the right time, you have to be there 150% minimally. So that you do it. Without yeah, and I think philosophically, you could also, you know, you could also say, well, maybe those other times weren't supposed to be for me. <clears throat> maybe there well, was supposed to be just a, you know, something else that happened that reminded me that I should have been paying attention. Who knows, right? Well, those things do remind you that you should have been paying attention. You know, you'd be doing something like that. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have had some, some good opportunities you know, which I was able to capitalize on. And one of the best was meeting my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, um, if I have a career, it's because we're together. You know, if it, I won't even call it a career. It's just what I do, you know, well, if, if, I'm, if I'm running around. But, you know, it, it's just an incredible thing. And all the music, music, uh, uh, I'm 78 now, and the music is just flowing. It's flowing more than it was, but a little differently now, a little more mature. Well, and that's that's part of it, too, is just learning to adapt and evolve with whatever is happening at whatever point in your life that you're at, right? Yeah. So let's start with some of your early career stuff. I know you grew up in New York, which, of course, is its own story right there. You know, New York in the 50s, 60s, it was a such a such a hotbed of so many different kinds of music and i'm kind of fascinated about the idea that you grew up in this era and of course i'm i'm old enough to remember this era too where there really wasn't such a factionalization of genres you know you listen to am radio you'd hear you know frank sinatra followed by the beatles followed by you know, Sly and the Family Stone, whatever it was, you'd, 
you'd hear all these different musical genres and there wasn't really this, it wasn't like you were a rock guy or you were a pop guy, but you really kind of learned a lot of different types of music and took them all as just plain music. Right, right. Well, you know, it goes along with, you know, with the success of those times. It really created the music business as a moneymaker. Along with that success comes categories, comes bandwagons, comes, well, this one worked, so let's get five more like that, and we'll <laughs> put them out on the road, and boom, you know. That was the mentality. That's what happened and with the evolution as the business got bigger, you know, and, and all the lawyers and their families. And, listen, you got to have, you know, it's all part of it. A lawyer, uh, an accountant, a musician, we all work together on that kind of stuff. But sure. the realities are that with all of the promotion, and it, it got bad because it, it came to be keep them out on the road, give them drugs, give them what they need. You know, that whole kind of thing. So there, you know, there you were doing your uh, touring. and But, you know, you really couldn't stop. You know, Jimi Hendrix had that problem. Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of artists had that problem. But um, but what is interesting to me about that in terms of your early career is that you were exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. Um, I know you mentioned in your book that you that some of your earliest work was touring with R&B artists, you know. I grew up on the first music that I listened to was uh, doo My sister, who was six years older, doo and she was a big fan. And then in my synagogue had a dance contest and I won a B.B. King, the blues record. I don't know how that got there. B.B. <laughs> King, the blues a killer album with B.B. with the big band. And, uh, you know, I listened to that, and then I went and got a guitar, and my parents got me guitar lessons, and I started to play guitar. But so all these different musics, folk music, jazz, and uh, my first tour was with the Exciters, which was a, an R&B band, had a big hit uh, called Tell Em. And um, uh, I became part of the backup band, and we toured the east coast in maine in the winter <laughs> you know my, my first tour it was amazing That's and working with these people mm -hmm. that i had never i grew up in a jewish uh, environment uh but at 18 and 19 i was expanding you know and uh, these folks were incredible when we play you know I, I was able to uh uh learn their music learn about them about me i was generally the only white musician in any of the shows uh, for whatever. And so I got a lot of input of, you know, great R&B artists, Chuck Jackson, Baby Washington, all, all these kind of people. And it was an incredible. So then I came in, I started playing trios in Manhattan as I'm evolving. I'm playing, you know, in supper clubs and this kind of stuff. And uh, Al Cooper, who was kind of like a semi-folky at that time, got me involved in folk music with Dylan. So now I'm now I'm R&B guy, and now with my R&B feel, I'm playing some folk music, which becomes folk rock. Uh -huh. So folk rock, you know, I'm playing folk rock and I'm doing that. And I'm also, at the same time, I'm playing jazz gigs, you know, blues jazz tunes. Uh, uh, just oh, tons of, tons of sidewinder, all these kind of great, great stuff. And so it's all these genres are happening simultaneously. And there are audiences for all of these. You go into the village, you can go to the village gate and you hear jazz. You go to Cafe of Gogo, -Go, you hear an R&B blues, folk music. And so great going for your on. musical vocabulary, I think, right? I mean, just uh, developing, developing your own uh, musical vocabulary to be able to just relate to yeah, not only all these different kinds yeah. of music, but the different kinds of culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it really is different. You know, mm -hmm. there's a thing yes. this the outcome, like what you know is you you play, you don't listen to what you're doing. You're listening to what your fellow musicians uh, are doing. And that's how you're playing music in your conversation. So all the vocabulary that you have, you know, it, it comes out, you know, it's dictated by uh, 
where the melody is and you know uh, uh -huh. you know where the other people are and what the sonic ranges are if everybody plays in the middle so you know you have gray crap yeah yeah although what, what i love is the idea that all these different genres were also kind of feeding each other and influencing each other as you say you know i mean you start out with folk and then rock kind of influences that and you end up with folk rock quote unquote you know and i i love the idea that these different styles and different cultures were really influencing each other at that point even more so than today oh tremendously because there were different things everything today is you know although i'm hearing lots, a lot a lot of great stuff that is you know out of the mainstream you know out of the mainstream it's very creative oh yeah now. that's it's, where uh, the creativity uh, is now yeah, yeah. That's, that's where it is the mainstream is we're on the bandstand you know and um no, but that's what it is. You know, I, I got a chance to make my album and I, you know, I always wanted to sing. I've never been a singer and I had a great time doing it with some great musicians here in Jerusalem. Um, so, you know, that's me at this time. So, but uh, the stuff I do is going to be coming from 1967 or 1970 or 1980 only now, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, there are you got old folk who are still here holding down some forts, but I got to tell you the the creative element out there is amazing. Brought because of the ability of, uh, I mean, to the studios, so great sorrow. You don't need a studio, you know. You just need a, and and the quality doesn't matter as long as it's audible, as long as you can hear. You know the quality of the artist. And the, and, the, and the way these things are now, the recorders and the phones and, and all the stuff. Well, you can collaborate over great distances now, too. You know. well, I do a lot of that. I do yeah. a lot of that here from Tel Aviv to, to uh, and from Jerusalem to America to mm -hmm. various. Uh, so yeah. it's all good. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's get into a little bit about your beginnings of session work. Cause I, I think that's sort of a fascinating story too. You know, Al Cooper tells his story about getting into that first Dylan session and you were sort of drafted into that too, uh, through your association with Al. Right. And I think that that's another whole set of lessons, isn't it? Learning the, I mean, it's one thing to be playing live with people. It's a completely different set of psychology mm -hmm. to get into the studio with people and, you know, let's talk a little bit about your exposure to that whole part of the business. Well, now I had done a few little demo sessions and, and it was always exciting. It was always an exciting thing to do. Uh, uh, so, but they would demo things and they didn't really mean anything, but to me, they were great. Mm -hmm. um, but when doing the uh, the Dylan thing, all of a sudden now I'm I'm stepping into the major leagues, and everything I do, everybody sees it, everybody hears it, <laughs> big speakers, you know. So and and here I am in a situation with no rehearsals. I don't know what's going. I have no. I don't know who Bob Dylan is. I don't know. That I think is the the funniest thing about it. You mentioned in your know. book basically, you know, he uh, he says you want to come play in a Bob Dylan session. You say who's Bob Dylan, right? Which, you in know, a way, was probably a good thing because, you, therefore, you weren't nervous about it. I would have been a lot more nervous, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so coming, so coming in there, what I did understand was I had to be able to come up with something, you know, and, and it had to be there at the same time that he liked the a take because... And based on the song, his interpretation, his feeling, what it was supposed to be. That's all his yeah, territory. And and so every time we go in to the control room to listen, uh, you know, there's some notes being taken, this or that, and you go back out. And uh, But what you know is every take, you've got to be as much there as possible. And you're looking for a device 
Now, how do I remember this? You write a chord chart out. Or you make some notes. You know, this is going to happen. Sometimes it's, you know, all this is happening spontaneously. I was fortunate that the Bobby Gregg, the drummer, was very, very incredibly timely drummer. Great time and great, uh, a lot of great stuff. We, he, he said, look, just look at me as we're going through it, and I'll give you the bass drum pattern that I'm going to play. And that's your basic, that's your home. You stick with that, you know, you're in good shape. So uh, as best I could, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know, I don't think that's the greatest playing I ever did on that album, but it certainly was the most exciting and the most meaningful well, and I think what's, what is more important than whether or not it was the greatest playing was that you understood, you understood a certain intuitiveness. And, you know, especially when you walk into a studio with an artist that you don't know, you don't know anything about them, you don't know how much of their judgment is spontaneous, capricious, whether right. they really have a vision in their head, and you're just trying to probe and figure out what's going to work. You're being very intuitive. You're just responding to the music and the the give and take between the players well no over the years what you know the scariest moments are when you're working with an artist who really doesn't know the tune <laughs> <laughs> they don't really know it you know mm-hmm. and so in, in not only are you now uh get, helping them get the song on the record you you end up helping them write the song they have to finish the song so you can, so the whole scenario can happen. And the performance, it's like Dylan played his stuff a lot. So when he mm-hmm. came to the studio, you know, this is what I like, this is how it is. And so, okay, ba-boom, ding, you go for it. Everything is exciting, everything is real. But, you know, there are artists, uh, you know, in, when I did the Doors stuff, mm. the Doors at that time were not, cohesive right you know, extremely talented every single one of them great guys and but as business. individuals not necessarily as a unit as a unit as a unit when when they were politically in agreement and emotionally similar and drug use was you know relative okay and paul rothschild who is a monster producer mm-hmm. you know who they used to hate a lot because he would not give in to anything. You know, he, <laughs> he did it until he got what he wanted. Uh-huh. So there's a good and bad to that as well. Sure. But, you know, you know the stuff with, with the doors, what we ended up having to do is uh, I helped them, you know, bridge sections together and get things out for Jim to come in and, uh, you know, do his part, you know, and they argued about all of it. But at the end, I think uh, the soft parade, though booed by many, I think is a pretty interesting album. You know, unlike anything they ever did or would do again. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it was unique. Absolutely, and it's it's interesting. Another friend of mine played uh, bass with them for a couple of years on tour as well, and had some similar stories about uh, how you know there were there was a lot of kind of discovery as you went along because to a certain extent, and and I guess this is true of a lot of artists, certainly artists that I've worked with um, that a lot of times, you know, there's, there's always a certain element of leaving things up to chance. You want to leave certain things up to chance because you want to be open to those happy accidents. Right. At the same time, if you leave too much of it to chance, you end up going in with no, no real clear navigation of where you want to go. And I think especially if you come in as a quote unquote hired hand, you know, Mm -hmm. play me a bass part. Well, what kind of bass part do you want? You know, and you're sort of hunting around. There's, there's a lot of, there's a combination there of the musical vocabulary, trying to express what it is you, you think they want, as well as the psychology of just trying to read the situation, trying to read the artist, read the people that you're working with. And, you know, it's, it's a combination of, I guess, you know, experience and also a little bit of hit and miss, right? Throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Well, yeah. You know, I got to the point, you know, I did it enough 
But in New York, I did a ton of sessions. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming out to L.A. and San Francisco, lots of sessions. So the thing I realized was that they hired me. They could have hired him or him, but they hired me. So if they hired me, they want me to play what I play. They want you to be you. Yeah. I should be me. So yeah. I come in and I be me. And and sometimes that works. Sometimes we sit back and say, well, we need a little less of you. <laughs> we need you more, you know. <laughs> And, and I gen and then I generally good naturedly you know go along with that, but do what I'm doing anyway, you know, and, mm -hmm. and make them like it. Well, and you know that's that's one of the things that I think is is uh, interesting about your approach. I mean, your playing is very intuitive. Your style is very intuitive. Um, you know, you are you are capable of just holding down the groove. I've heard you, you know, you, you blast out for, you know, four bars here and there, and then you go right back into the groove. And that to me, as, as a fellow bass player, you know, that, that to me is the epitome of what a bass player should do. You know, you're not there to show off with every single note. Otherwise you're going to need a bass player behind you, you know, right. <laughs> you know, my, my attitude is that's my attitude. Basically I like what bass does in that context. So that is fun for me. But, you know, over the years, as, as I've grown, uh, now I'm, I finally figured out a lot of things that slowed me down in my non-scholastic uh, learning process, you know, which kind of like opened up some extra doors. But they have, a separate, they have a separate place. When I'm playing in my role, when I, you know, I love that. I love that pocket. I love yeah. playing in the pocket. And that's, uh, you know, that's a lot of fun. Because if you've got musicians who are communicating, listening to each other, you know, that's when stuff happens. And I think that's, you know, to me, that's what's always drawn me toward the bass as, not just as an instrument, but as a part of an ensemble is that you really are, I mean, first of all, you are the bridge between the rhythm element and the melody. You are that anchor, but you also... You know, I, I've had this conversation with a lot of friends about why so many bass players become producers, because I think there is this sort of intrinsic understanding of the entire ensemble, where you fit into that ensemble. You're not a solo player. You're, you're really part of a group. People, people notice when the bass drops out. People notice when the bass hits a wrong note. People notice when they drop the bass, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there and and there's a certain power to that. But at the same time, I think what's really cool is the idea that you have this almost sort of quiet command of the entire orchestra in a way. You do because all you have to do is move a whole step down, and the harmony shifts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. control over that harmony. You know, like in in my writing. Uh, the bass lines really play uh, a lot you know, you know, in certain circumstances, you know, just to help me keep shaping, reshaping. You know, I kind of look at it like a sculpture sometimes or, or just something, you know, when you're messing around with it. You know, and one of the things I like about uh, systems like Logic, uh, these computer studios, you can do that. Yeah. You, know, you can hear what it sounds like. It's a tool. It's a great tool. You know, and now it turns out it can be a great record as well. Uh, you know, well, and, and that was that was another question I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, you you came up in an era where everything was, you know, we had to record on tape, and we had to usually go. I mean, now I came up in you know sixteen and twenty four tracks. You came up even earlier than that. You know, my first session after I played with Dylan. I, uh, Jack, uh, oh, uh, over at, uh, oh, what the heck's that label? The folk label. Uh, Which one? Um, not Reprise. Um, uh, in, uh, in New York. Uh, I can't think of it offhand. But I got offered a bass album. Uh, it was Electra. Oh, uh-huh. Jack Holtzman. Mm. You know, and they wanted me to do a bass album because I played with Dylan, an instruction album. And so uh, Arthur Gorson, who was a uh, manager of a lot of the folk artists I was working with 
Eric Anderson, Richie Haven, all these people. Uh, he got the deal. And so who's my engineer? It was two track. Two track. Mm. And my engineer was uh, Bill Simzik. Ooh. Uh-huh. So his first album, my first album, is a Harvey Brooks bass method on Electra. Not easy to catch that one, but it's it's out there somewhere. Uh -huh. uh, and it was wild. So that, and we both had our firsts on that and went on to do some other things together. He did a rhinestone record with me later on in time. So how was that for you, you know, as the technology changed? Did that, did that, I mean, I know that basically you're the same player that you've always been. Did it change your, did it change your, your methodology of working at all as technology evolved? I just added, just added um, capabilities. Uh, and it, I was once, uh, I was managing a studio in uh, uh, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, for a while. And we had the best gear on the planet. Uh, I forget what they were now. Uh, the, the best stuff. Um, 24 track, 2 track. Um, I think English they were or something. Mm -hmm. but we're sitting there one day, you know, and we just finished this uh, recording, you know, and, and uh, Jimmy Mayweather, guy who was an engineer there at that time, you know, we start this conversation, you know, that 24 track really makes a lot of noise, just a like clunks along and, you know, when you're <laughs> editing, it's a, you know, I so, say, you know, one of these days, it's just going to be little chips and, you know, we were just fantasizing, you know, and, and it'll be all be able to do it all electronically, and, and boom, that's what happened. Yeah. You know, and it also is what happened with violin sections and, and sessions. And, and we, you know, I remember being on one of the first sessions with a string synthesizer, and the union was up in arms. You know, and sure. I was, they didn't like that. Sure. I didn't like it when disco came in and took my job away. Sure. You know, and, and I mean, it's, it, it, it's funny because a lot of, you know, a lot of bass players at that point picked up their first mini Moog or something, you know, and started learning synth that's bass. What you, yeah. That's what you're going to do. Yeah. And that, I think, is part of it in general, you know, just learning to evolve with the times and everything. But, you know, it's um, it's funny because I, you know, I, I, um, I teach a class in recording and a lot of the kids that I've worked with have a you know, I have a conversation with them about the whole idea of the interplay between the bass and the drummer. And a lot of them haven't experienced that because all they've got is loops, you know, and I think there's a, there's a certain change to the way the music is laid down because of that. Well, you know, from one point of view, it's laid down with the groove mm -hmm. specifically in mind. You don't want to rattle the dancers. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stick in any of those little extra stuff because they're gonna lose their step. You're gonna break their legs, yeah. <laughs> break their legs. So you know, it's that kind of thing. Uh, the whole thing about the the abilities that you have now is you can get you know you can get to a lot of fields that you couldn't get to before because just by using uh, uh, oh by the way it's Neve. Ah, uh, Neves, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Neve. Yep. Neve, Studer, Neve, console, mm -hmm. Studer machines. 8068. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of, uh, you know, it's all that stuff. And and when, you know, for me, I listen to the bass drum pattern. It, it allows me, you know, to not only can you play together and be powerful, you can play off each other. Yes. You know? Sometimes you just want that backbeat to have nothing and it's louder than anything else because there's nothing there. You just have a big empty two and it's a giant space that is loud. The, you know, all those kind of things when you're dealing with human uh, facilities. Sure. Sure. And that, you know, I mean, you, you of all people, you played with miles. Now, you know, one of the things that miles was so big on was where not to play the space between the notes. Right, 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 right. Well, you know, also, it was my first real experience playing jazz music professionally uh -huh. and, and accordingly wise. I played with lots of 
of local groups and friends that we all played the jazz bebop tunes and <clears throat> but then, you know this was a and it was nothing like I could have ever imagined because it's all it was all just feel you know it was uh -huh. like watch miles go stop find a groove my job was to find the bottom because I'm certainly not going to get in the way of Dave Holland <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. one of the best bass players in the world ever. And uh, so, you know, for me, that was incredible. But it allowed me, and, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. It was pure intuition. Totally. And just, and just. Maybe that's why it was so good. That, that's what, that's what worked. Mm -hmm. And Tio Macero, uh, and I got that job through Tiro, Tio. Uh, when I was staff producing at Columbia, Tio had the office next to me, and we got talking. And and uh, so when the opportunity came up, and Miles wanted to try something for his wife Betty uh, to see if Columbia would take her on as an artist. And so I went down to do that, and that's where I got the Miles gig because after that he said, "Hey, Avi, you know, talk to Tio." <laughs> <laughs> okay, Miles, <laughs> and. Uh, so we did that, you know, and uh, now uh, the the album when it was amazing, you know, I, I couldn't listen to it for about twenty years. Really, it freaked me out completely. I mean, was, Bitches Brew is one of his landmark albums in that sense, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, but it I think you know, it's 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 funny to me because you, as you say, you came up in this, you know, kind of folk and rock genre as your main thing but yet in certain ways working with those kind of artists working on that kind of music also really taught you a whole lot about feel and feel was as you say exactly what what miles was calling for more than anything else right and and that is a positive attitude about what you're doing you could be going through mental games but when it comes time to take care of business that comes first yeah so Go for what works. Uh -huh. you, know, you shut everything else out, and the assessment is what is called for here, you know, and and you find it, and you find something, and then you grab onto it, and then you can gradually, you know, that goes for, you know, really, that's music. That's in general. It you is. Know, even, with, even with the paper, even when you're reading the paper, the paper's a suggestion, except if some people really want it, you know, and that's amazing stuff. But, you know, that's not my thing. I was going to say that's that's, uh, you know, there are many musicians who are really, really great at that. I've never considered myself one. In fact, you know, put notes in front of me and it'll slow me down. But uh, but, but, you know, I think there 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 is certainly a place for that kind of music and that kind of playing. But we're talking about that strictly intuitive feel based playing that obviously you developed early on and. As I say, I think that's a combination of having a good musical vocabulary and also really, you know, it epitomizes the whole idea of, you know, there's a stereotype of a certain type of bass player and you fit it, you know, the, the quiet guy in the back who just kind of holds down the groove, you know. And I think, you know, sort of certain parts of that are human nature, human psychology. You know, if you think about it, man, you're – you're really just, you're reading the room. You're reading all your fellow players and you're, you're playing off of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is a, there is a direction, you know, you have it like when you record a song, to me, this is the ultimate process. You record, you go to the studio or whatever your method is and everything is parts. Mm-hmm. In one sense, it goes like this. Right. And even those parts are expanded and complicated or simple or whatever they are. That's the song. That's how you recorded it. That's what that is. Now, you go to a live performance, you take that and play it. Uh -huh. And then it really comes to life, you know, or and, and maybe the ultimate is you played exactly like the record. And then you go into your interpretation of it. <laughs> well, that and that's letting it breathe. That's yeah. where you stretch in that. That's sense. where you stretch. Yeah. And, you know, 
And, and that's why you spend all those hours practicing so that when that moment comes, you know, without being obnoxious, you could get your lick in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I want to, I want to touch on another thing that kind of weaves through your book a little bit, and that's the, the lessons learned about music business. Right. You know, you, you talk a lot of times about how, you know, because you kind of let things flow and you, you did, you had sort of a, a laissez-faire attitude about a lot right. of it because you were fortunate enough to be in a lot of the right places at the right time. Yeah. But there's also a discovery that happens as you start learning certain things like, you know, uh, certain musicians and their drug habits, certain, certain um, aspects of dependability and timing. I don't mean timing in terms of musical timing, but being there at the right time, showing up, all of this right. kind of responsibility stuff. There was a real, uh, there was sort of a, an awakening within you at a certain point of realizing that, hey, I got to make a living at this, right? This is my profession. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what happens when you, one, actually think that it goes on forever. <laughs> All you have to do is just sit on the seat and ride it and, and uh, you know. But there's like a lot of hungry dogs out there looking to get your seat. Yeah. And so if you don't maintain your energy. You know, I lost a lot of opportunity. I smoked too much reefer. I started drinking. Oh, well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, you know, hang up the phone. You know, that's how lame it can be, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, in some of the environments, you know, that uh, I, I picked a bad hat. I never went over the edge, never shot heroin, never did any of that kind of stuff. But I did everything else pretty much, you know, and, and, and I was able to survive it, you know, but it just tore the shit out of me. So well, you, I, when you're young, you're invincible, you know, that's the thing. And you yeah. really believe it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And so, and so um, after my last, uh, one of the last tours I did, I think was uh, not my last tours, but when I made my, uh, uh, new way to live my life, uh, those kind of tours, those kind of uh, musical uh, endeavors, I had to take put out of my life. You know, uh, I was very fortunate uh, that my wife, Bonnie, uh, my partner in life, uh, we were old friends from, sco from school, uh, Van Buren High School, <laughs> and uh, in Queens, you know, and we met up again in in midlife. She was divorced. Uh, I was uh, off the road for a while now, and uh, what a blessing that was for me more than her. But you know, it, uh, we were beshed, as we say. Yep. You know, we, we were meant for each other, and and went together thirty three years now, and uh, it's like an amazing thing. But through that, it brought me back into having a meaning. What was missing in my life at that point was family warmth. You know, it's one thing, you know, to crash at your mom's. <laughs> you know, that's mom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's what moms do. Bonnie's an incredible mother. Um, so kind of rejuvenated my, uh, my whole life. And so... All of, the, all of those things that what I began to figure out is that I can't, if I have to worry about anything, if, if I leave, if I'm smoking weed or if I'm high and I'm not getting what's supposed to be done, done, that doesn't go away. What happens is it comes around the corner and smacks you in the back of the head. Yep. yep. Twice, at least twice as bad as it was had you dealt with it originally. Sure. Sure. You know, and, and that's, you know, some of my lessons, you know. Uh, well, uh, and I think that's a that's a struggle that a lot of artists go through because there really is a direct almost. A, I mean, it's, it's a dichotomy there between having that, you know, sort of laissez faire attitude of letting things unfold, which is, you know, in certain ways, the epitome of an artist versus the whole 
commerce aspect of it, the whole I need to actually be organized aspect of it, which I'm sure, you know, coming in as a staff producer to a company like CBS, you know, all of a sudden you go from being the really the the loose, relaxed musician who can smoke a dube and just say, you know, eh, tomorrow, whatever. And all of a sudden you're showing up at an office. That's got to be right there in education in that sense. No, that was deep. That was deep. Um, but it was great. You know, I was comfortable. Uh, I had a mentor next door to me. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Cooper was, I think, was he left right as I came in. Cooper left uh, Columbia. Um, and so it was, you know, and my job was to, they, they hired me to get the psychedelic uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, because Columbia wanted to be that. Yeah, yeah. But I was kind of more R&B. Um, so I signed John Hall. Not that he's an R&B artist. But he was a good pop artist. Um, and we did an album. Didn't go. I did an R&B album with Bobby Lester. Killer R&B album. No promotion. But when I was with uh, John Hall out in California, we were doing this album. You know, it, it came upon me that I'm better off as a musician, a freelance musician, and be a freelance producer. Being in that situation. I mean, I sat at many meetings with Clive. How's this one? You know, I mean, he, he okayed two projects for me. I can't complain, you know, but that's what that was. You know, I, I experienced that first class. Well, and you came from a completely different culture. As you say, you had been, you had spent so many years in the whole, you know, Bay Area music scene going through, going through, you know, the, the super session debacle, shall we say, the, uh, you know, the, the electric flag thing, you know, where you really had to learn not only to deal with so many disparate personalities, but, you know, drug problems among your bandmates and stuff like that. I think that, that, that whole scene was kind of unraveling as it was developing. The, uh, the electric flag originally was a six piece band. Um, Junkies killed it. Yeah. Yeah. They brought in a couple of guys. One of the horn players was strung out. Um, Bloomfield, very erratic. You know, yeah, you and I had our conversation about my my uh, experience with Bloomfield as well. You know, brilliant but very erratic. Yes. And and the thing about it is, what I think is the rudest thing you can do is not show up or yeah. come yeah. Or, or come and leave when you want. You know, because I couldn't sleep. Yeah, those kind of things, you know, you don't want, that's the way some people are and that's the way they lead their lives and they don't last that long. Well, that's the, that's the artist. That's the temperamental artist aspect. And that's, that's what I'm talking about with the whole delineation between music and business, art and commerce. You know, some people can be absolutely brilliant to the point where their brilliance will sustain them if they have the right business partners around them. Right, right, to, to, to keep them in focus. Yeah. There well, are a lot of times they implode. You know, there, yeah, there are, I mean, there are a lot of musicians over the last 20 years who, who learned about doing business. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. even the Grateful Dead from the 60s, they know, you know, they stayed together long enough to establish a model. A yes. business model, you know, and that's amazing. I mean, lots of bands, you know, those kind of musical organizations deserve kudos. You know, they, just to stay together and 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 keep it going is an amazing thing. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I work with a lot of people in the pro audio sector as well, and there was a similar kind of evolution there. You know, there were a lot of brilliant inventors. You know, who I mean, you talk about the Grateful Dead. You know, they had this wall of sound created by Owsley and, and, you know, um, one of the main developers behind that was a guy named John Meyer, who to this day heads up Meyer Sound, you know, and I have long maintained that somebody like John Meyer, he's an absolutely brilliant engineer, but without the marketing savvy and expertise of his wife, Helen, 
he'd probably still be making speakers in a garage somewhere. Right. You know, there, sure. there's a certain understanding of that business aspect of it that you got to have in order to sustain past the initial brilliance of that shooting star. You know, otherwise you're going to burn out. There's got to be follow up. Yeah. Yeah. Follow up. You know, the, yeah, it's great that you come up with this, but who knows about it? Right. Who, who can get it? I mean, why, why would they want it if they don't know about it? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. And I, I, I remember having a conversation with a friend a few years ago. I was at uh, this event that a magazine used to put on. It was called Bass Player Live. Huh. And it was, uh, they would book SIR in Hollywood. And they would bring in all the bass amp companies and the bass the, the base manufacturers and everything. And you'd be in a room, you know, the big, the big room at, at SAR in Hollywood. And you got, you know, a hundred bass players walking around the room and sampling bases and trying out amps. And, you know, everywhere you go, you're hearing, you know, kathunk, kathunk, pop, pop, slap, slap. And it's wonderful. And I can hear 15 year old kids that can play circles around me and probably you and everybody we know in terms of their actual uh, technical prowess, but you know, how many of them are really going to make it? How many of them are going to have all of the elements right and have that all fall into place and be able to follow it up? Yeah. There's that much room. <laughs> exactly. There's, I mean, I mean, the, it just keeps getting, you know, and when, when one guy gets dethroned, you know, it'll be another one and another one will come. That's an, you know, that's like another area that's, that's really, it's cool. You know, it's, it's for, for aficionados of the, everything about bass. Sure. You know, the amplifiers, the, the, you know, the new things, you know, I try to keep up somewhat, you know, I have an, an amplifier, a Harky, uh -huh. which is fabulous. <laughs> sure. Um, and, uh, but you know, and it, all, the, the things I experiment with pretty much are in the computer. Uh, and then uh, if I go out on a gig, I may, I may try one thing occasionally or just try a few different things out. But I just hate leaving the pocket. You know? That's, yeah, that's, that's, I think, a big part of it right there for me is that all of that stuff is window dressing. And it's wonderful. But if you don't have that basis of, first of all, understanding where you fit into the whole equation, and then also really understanding that it's not about showing off and being a soloist in that sense. You know, it's about, it's about being part of an ensemble. But, you know, yeah. But I stopped at Jocko. And, and there's I, a perfect example. There's a perfect example well, of well, absolute well, brilliance, well, absolute brilliance. You know, one of the most amazing players of our, of our lifetime Composer, the composer. Yes, yes. What are you going to do? You know, everybody's got their own destiny in life, obviously, right? Yeah, but I'll tell you, I mean, I, I, some of the players, I love, I, I love to see the facility on the instrument that, you know, where it's gone to. Sure. Um, it's, and some of it's over my head, a lot of it's over my head, but I, I can appreciate what I'm hearing, you know, but not too long, not for too long. I'm good yeah. for like about 10, 15 minutes tops. <laughs> well, and you know, that's, that I think is, you know, and, and maybe we're old fashioned in that respect, but you know, to me, that's the role of a bass player. The bass player should be, should be present, should be the strong foundation. Right. But you know, I mean, I don't, I don't need you to slap and pop every three notes. No, no, it yeah. loses its meaning. It loses its whole purpose. But yeah. I figure I'm old enough now to uh, be comfortable doing whatever I, coming through my hands. And I play a lot of guitar now. I write a lot on the guitar and the piano. Um, you know? The you're happy doing what you're doing. Just keep the energy going. Yeah. And never stop. So last question for you. You've been through literally decades of evolving as a human being, but also watching the industry evolve. 
And mm-hmm. obviously it's, you know, technologically it's different. Uh, marketing is different. Everything is different about the industry now. What advice would you have for 15 year old you coming up now? Oh, it's easy. It's, I mean, all they have to do is TikTok. All they have to do is come up with anything. Any people, young musicians coming up, depending on what their parents have taught them. If their parents have played good music for them, you know, I suggest parents play classical music, play jazz, play rock and roll, play all the musics you have experienced in your life. Oh, and if it's only been classical, then only play that and they'll go do that. Or they'll be influenced. Oh, they'll never do any of that. They'll completely do anything different than that. But whatever it is, you know, give them the opportunity. But the, the technology and the tools now are so, it, you know, can allow anybody to do anything. So it's really just developing taste. And each market has its own taste. So it's like a taste for this, a taste for that, a taste for this, a taste for that. And I think for young musicians and young people, follow your dreams. You know, listen enough. Listen to your elders. Listen to the music that's out there. Listen to your family. Listen to everybody and do what you want. (laughs) That is great advice right there. Listen to everybody and do what you want. <laughs> Reminds me of an old line that I had heard years ago about uh, your kids are going to grow up to be exactly who they're going to be and they're going to blame you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just a way of the world. It's so true. It's so true. Harvey Brooks, thank you for being my guest. My pleasure. Daniel. I enjoyed our conversations. Thank you very much. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.